So we're back in the Gospel of John series, which I started years ago and broke off at uh, the end of chapter three. So we've picked up a chapter four and now we're in chapter six. And just before we move into the text, just a real brief consideration. Um, don't want you to be thinking about this. The, the uh, Gospel of John is used to teach some pretty uh, significant um, positions on what the Lord's Supper represents, and the, we have the um, those passages coming up in the weeks ahead. I want you to have some basic consideration. But when Jesus said, do it in remembrance of him, what is he wanting us to remember? And one of the things that I said, which I appreciate you continuing on in 2 Samuel 8, one of the things I can appreciate is that if we look at scripture simply enough, we can see the Lord's Supper in every passage because it's a simple message, the message of the cross. And that's, that's the message of vitality for our life. But um, if you remember last week when Joel presented chapter seven, uh, Joel, I'm just kidding, not Joel, but David had this big dream, this big vision, this big desire in terms of serving the Lord. And he wanted to build God a house. And God said, no, uh -uh, I'm not gonna do that. And I want us to recognize that when God says no to us, that actually is that type of death that we have to deal with. We have an idea, we have a desire, we have a plan, we have a hope, we have a dream, we have an expectation, and then God says no. But what God said to David is what he also says to us. If we take up our cross and follow the Lord, then that which is death to us will actually be the source of life. And that's what God said to David, I'm gonna build you a house. And chapter eight is stunning in terms of the Lord's Supper because here we have the flip side. Chapter seven, David dies to his dream and ambition. Chapter eight, God fulfills his promise and totally establishes the kingdom. And just so you know, from a historical standpoint, the nation of Israel reached the pinnacle of its geographical size and its conquering of the people that God had commanded them to conquer reached the pinnacle during King David's reign. And afterward, years later, it gradually shrinks back down. But if you paid really close attention to the reading today, the, river, the Euphrates River was mentioned, which is all the way down back to that barrier of where Babylon and the like, where Abraham came over from. So it's really, really interesting passage. But now as we move into today's passage, I really want to get you to think a little bit. So I've entitled the message, um, Feeding the 5,000 Wrong Responses. And then the subtitle, the doctrine here is, what is your response near the place where you have eaten bread after the Lord had given thanks? Now, I'm going with this as the basic doctrinal focus this morning. It was the verse that the Lord just quickened to my spirit as I was reading, and I, it, it has given life to the whole understanding of the passage that I prepared this morning. But I'm um, going to give my testimony really briefly from just one little angle. I was saved June 11th, 1977, and on June 11th, 1978, I was sort of in a little bit of uh, a conundrum might be the best word. It wasn't, cer certainly wasn't a crisis. I'm one year old in the Lord. Since the day of my conversion, the Lord told me who I was to marry. He confirmed who I was to marry. Six months later, I married my wife, Sally. You didn't marry me back then? Oh, I'm sorry, and so it was still 77. No, 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 my story is around 78. When we got married, it was 77 still, December of 77. That was six months later. 
And then we <laughs> so I apologize. Uh, it was it was June of seventy nine, two years after we got married. <laughs> well, I always number our wedding from the day I got saved. Sorry. <laughs> All right, can we rewind the tape? But set the clock back five minutes. Start over. So anyway, I'm going to give a little bit of my testimony. <laughs> You're not going to believe anything I say now. So, um, I got saved June 11th, 1977. I know that's true. 67? It wasn't 77. Oh, I'm sorry. It was, <laughs> we came to Frederick. <laughs> we came to Frederick in 77. <laughs> you should come a little closer, honey. and you should, I should get an earpiece where you could whisper in my ear what's... I'm saying wrong, so we don't <laughs> have to disturb the church. Okay, so I was <laughs> I was saved on June 11th, 1972. Oh, that's right. And we got married in December of 72. And so in um, June of 19. 73, that's, I'm, I'm right on this one. June of 1973, my wife and I had moved to Washington Bible College, and um, I remembered my conversion. Now, when I was saved, I was, it was a huge amount of significant breakthrough of the Lord in my life. Joy of the Lord was so substantially pressed upon me. However, one year later, I'm kind of like, Wondering, well, how come I'm not like, you know, fizzing out of the bottle top like I was when I was born again one year ago? What's, what's happened to me? And so I used my initial conversion experience as a false standard of expectation of how I should be living every day of my life. And so as my wife and I are mulling this over, I get this huge vision in the course of days and months. And my huge vision was, I was gonna do this and I was gonna do that and we were gonna, um, I'm not gonna tell you all the details of it because that's not necessary. But I had these big visions and my wife looked at me a little bit fearfully and said, is this God speaking or you? And it was, a, it was a valid question. Of course, wives always have to ask that valid question. That's, their whole life is centered around asking those questions. But um, what the title of the message is, what was my response near the place where I'd eaten bread that Jesus broke, I suddenly tried to have a repeat. And probably one of the most important spiritual lessons for my life at that time came through my wife's consider, uh, counsel to consider and I realized I'm trying to mirror, trying to mirror a past experience. I'm trying to make the future about representational evidence going forward of what happened in the past. And it was a huge lesson and I let go of some really wild ambitions that I had that had I gone after those things would have definitely wreaked havoc in our lives as a couple in our ability to serve the Lord. But to get this thing set up, I, I want you to understand that we all have experiences in some fashion, and then we all respond or reflect or react to those experiences later. And it's important that you properly respond to those experiences, but beware how you do it. So I just want to exhort us all as we begin the message, your, our greatest witness, your greatest witness is how you respond near the place where you've eaten bread after the Lord has given thanks. How you respond is the core evidence of true faith or deep doubt. Now, I'll spend the message refining that, but the picture from the scripture here is other boats came over from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread 
after the Lord had given thanks. And that's the, that's the Apostle John, but just so you know, writing this you know, nearly 50 years later, it's the Apostle John just giving a little bit of perspective. And it's not the reflection of the people, but it's the reflection of John. And for some reason, the Holy Spirit really quickened that to my heart this morning as I was finishing preparation for the message. So I want to go through the text fairly quickly. We've read it already once, but as I mentioned as I began reading it in the beginning, there's this great multitude of people, and actually, actually they'd been with Jesus for three days, and in the context of how this all came about, uh, their fast, the, the Passover was near, and I think the reason John added that little bit about the Passover was to emphasize how large the crowds really were because the Passover was the one time every year where the Jews were commanded to come to Jerusalem and offer their Passover sacrifice at the temple. And so the place was always overrun with um, travelers from outreaches of, Jer of Jerusalem, I mean of Israel. And that's a part of the context of the story. And so Jesus sees this great multitude coming, coming towards him. He, he gives a test. To Philip and I and I want us to pay attention to this picture because this directly applies to you and I today in our own circumstance are you frustrated about something are you a little bit disappointed something's not going your way are are you looking at a situation that's contains some threat um, you're getting a little bit fearful about how things are going to pan out with that circumstance. <clears throat> Until you and I recognize through that remembrance of the Lord's table every day of our life, our lives are marked with the cross. The cross is the continual death to us, to our expectations, to our dreams, to our imagination, to our hopes, to how we thought it was going to turn out. You, you can put whatever little line you want to put in there. But the cross is God's intentional instrument of death for us. And what's hard for you and me is what was hard for Philip in this passage. Jesus asked Philip a question. And you could say it was a trick question. You could say it was a trick question because... Jesus already knew the answer. He just wanted to hear the floppy, sloppy, worthless human answer that we, got, that we can come up with. Our best spiritual reasoning is floppy, sloppy. And you know why our best spiritual reason is floppy, sloppy? Because you and I don't have any idea what God's doing. We don't know what the object is of his coming into our life with a cross at the moment he comes into our life with the cross and so <clears throat> um, <laughs> uh, so Jesus said to Philip where shall we buy bread for all these to eat and Philip is like I, I don't know Lord one of the translations said it's like if we had three months wages it wouldn't be enough to buy bread for everybody this is a huge crowd but the Bible is there here is saying in, in the text he said it to test him. And then one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter, speaks up and said, here's a lad with five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they about so many? And I just, I, I love the introduction of Philip's uh, suggestion. And when I was a boy standing, hearing the gospel read as a child, and I heard this account, I always remember my emotions. Of course, I was a boy. So, but the first emotion was, man, I wish it was my lunch you found. And then the second thing I thought was, we only get peanut butter sandwiches, though. We don't have any little fish. <laughs> then I went back on, on topic. And uh, I was just wondering, well, that's a really wonderful thing to suggest. And as a child, I, I don't know if it was because I knew the story or whatever. As a child, I immediately thought of Philip's excuse me, um, not Phillips, but uh, Simon's, no, not Simon's, Andrew, Andrew's response. I immediately thought of the fact that 
he started to see a resource that God could use and then after human analysis dismissed it because it was insufficient. Now, the rest of your life, if God is ever going to use you, if God is ever going to use you as one of his resources, the first realization that you have to come to is that it, you're insufficient. And when you look at yourself, you, you will say immediately, well, Lord, what am I? I don't, I don't have anything. I don't have enough. I don't have what it takes. And so I just like this momentary surge from Andrew and then withdrawal and disappointment. I like to illustrate our condition that we have. And this is why we celebrate the Lord's Supper every Sunday to remind ourselves, this is our lot. This is our life. We have the sentence of death written in ourselves. And the sentence of death, I mean, the picture simply is this. There's not enough resources to go around. So somebody's going to have to die. Somebody's not going to get the resource. Now, Jesus just told Andrew to have the people sit down. And they did. And then he takes the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples. And I, I want us to just pause for a moment about that phrase, and when he had given thanks. Because the Apostle John seems to center the whole dialogue around that picture that something changed about the circumstance when the Lord gave thanks. And I, and I think that we can say this morning with absolute confidence, whatever circumstance you're in, whatever your trial, your difficulty, your conundrum, your worry, your fear, whatever it is, you can pronounce a heavenly blessing on your circumstance when you give God thanks. When you thank him for what you see, when you thank him for what the need is, and when you bring it to his feet and you say, thank you, Lord. I was talking to somebody this week and I, and I realized often for us believers, it's, it's easier to thank God for really, really difficult things because they're so huge and so obvious that we could never do it. The more difficult part is when we have, okay, instead of having five loaves, we have 5,000 loaves, but everybody needs a loaf and a half. So it's going to be a little tight. and We're going to have to establish a rule, family hold back. And when we get to that place, we tend to uh, lose out on the, the, the imaginative pronouncing of thanksgiving on what we do or what's going on. Now, I want you to mark, if you're, if you're taking notes, I want you to just write Romans 1. And I want you to mark the little passage, uh, I think it's verse uh, 19 and 20 and 21, chief one. But in that, in that Romans 1 passage, it's a spectacular passage because it's one of those huge 30,000 foot pictures of redemption. And in verse 17, Paul is describing how the gospel has come. So we're saved by faith. So God has chosen to reveal his redemption through faith. The just shall live by faith. And then in verse 18, he kind of turns the corner and he says, but the wrath of God is revealed against all godlessness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Now, what does it mean to be a godless person? Or excuse me, what does it mean to behave godlessly and hold the truth in unrighteousness? To be a godless person and hold the truth in unrighteousness is to, is to know God in some fashion, in some way. Children of Israel, delivered out of Egypt with a mighty hand, all the firstborn, from Pharaoh all the way to the least slave in the field. All the firstborn died. Firstborn of cattle. Huge devastation. So much so that it moved Pharaoh finally to say, get out of here. And they all leave. And they all have this tremendous blessing. And all the neighbors just pile on silver and gold and clothing and goods to bless them on their way. Get them out of town. 
Then they get down to the Red Sea. And what happens? Pharaoh sort of recovered. Oh, what did we do? We got rid of all of our free labor. So he gets his army and he starts coming and God had a plan. God had a plan. He said, you know what? I'm not going to take them in the direct route to the place we're going. I'm going to take them an indirect route, a little longer route. And he's had a reason. God said, I know that they're going to fail if they see war. They're not ready for war yet. So he sovereignly directs them over to the Red Sea, pins them up against the Red Sea, and Pharaoh discovers them and he's bearing down on them. And what happens to these people? These people fail to give God thanks at the place where from their visible eyes their needs far exceed their capacity to take care of their own needs. They're not trained soldiers. They have no armament. And not only that, Pharaoh with the chariots are coming. They're going to overrun them. And so what we see is the failure of the Israelites was failure to remember <laughs> what had happened. When God had blessed the bread, the Passover had occurred. The Lord's Supper that we share today is a direct memorial of the Passover. But the children of Israel did not, in any way, shape, or form, remember. They didn't give thanks. Now, consequently, as time goes on, they get through the Red Sea. Marvelous, glorious deliverance. The seas divided into two walls. They walk through on dry ground. And then all of Pharaoh's armies is totally destroyed. A provision beyond their wildest imaginations. They had national songs that they began singing in commemoration of that. And at the very next occasion, when the water, everybody's thirsty and the water was bitter, what do they do? They don't remember. They don't give thanks. And I want us to understand here that what is needed in yours and my life in everyday situation is this. First of all, may, may you reflect simply enough to realize what, what your lack really is, what your shortcoming really is. May God give you and I that blessing to see how much in need we are. <clears throat> But then as we, as we see that need, as we see that want, that we would give thanks to God for that need and bless our needs in his name, asking him to lead and guide and direct. It's interesting that they gathered up the fragments and there were 12 baskets. And I don't want to get carried away trying to put spiritual inference into it. But I... I just feel like what Jesus said, so that none is lost. I, I think it's important for you and I to remember, when God does something for you, for I, for me, on the one hand, there tends to be a lavishness of it. But on the other hand, with a lavishness, there tends to be waste. There tends to be waste. We just have what we need, we have what we want, and now the rest is whatever. If Jesus had not given up that command to gather up the fragments, I wonder what would have happened to that excess bread. I wonder how much of it would have just been lying on the grass on the hillside in lack of appreciation for the huge, credible, miraculous provision that God had given. And you might be able to say this is a lesson on stewardship. That as God gives you provisions, you're obligated to have such respect for God providing it for you that you treat every penny with, with, with a sense of treasure and value because God gave it to you. That's a fair thing. I mean, he didn't want anything lost that was left over. He didn't do anything wasted. And it's important for you and I to recognize 
When we enter a problem, we tend to forget to give God thanks for it. After God has lavishly met our need, we tend to diminish the lavishness of the need and allow some of that lavish provision to go to waste, to be carelessly thought of. Both of those are the extremes of the human condition. Now, I told you to go to Romans 1, but going to that passage again in Romans 1, it talks about this group of people who, when they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, and neither were they thankful. And that is the chronic issue of humanity. But how does that work out? How is it that when you know God, you don't glorify him, God, and neither are you thankful? Well, I use those couple of accounts with the Jews coming out of Egypt to illustrate that point. They knew God, the mighty deliverer. When they knew God, they didn't glorify him as God, and neither were they thankful. When do you glorify God? When are you thankful to God? You must be thankful to God. The place of giving God the glory is at the cross when you're ready to die, and every expectation that you ever dreamed of is ready to dash. That's when you give him thanks. That's when you pronounce thanksgiving. And that's when you worship God and give him the glory to his name. Because you're at a place, again, where it's insufficient for you to be in charge. It's, it's insufficient for your plan to be the only plan in effect. You absolutely need the Lord's deliverance. The life of the Christian, the life of the cross, is such a simple life because God wants to continuously push us to the place of our need so that we might continually come to him through that cross of our need, give him thanks, and give him glory, and let him be God in our midst. Now we come to the responses of people. So all these people see the sign. Now I want to I say something about the signs of Jesus. This is, in my opinion, uh, fairly similar to all of his miracles because each time Jesus did a miracle, it really was unexpected. There, were, there really wasn't a predominating sense of faith that people were just, oh yeah, we, you know. We just, when we have a need, we just go and pray to Jesus and he heals our need. We, it's always unexpected. However, in this particular case, it wasn't just one leper or 10 lepers that got healed. It was 5,000 people that the healing was, their belly was filled. So it's a huge miracle in the most practical everyday area of life, having something to eat. And so what we find here is, you know, we talked a couple weeks ago about tares. There's, there's wheat, there's the seed, there's the true believers. And then there's the tares, there's the, there's the pretenders, there's the ones that in there in our midst at the time being, while things are going well, they look just like wheat. They're growing up, they're springing up, they have root, they're same color, stem, same size, they look very much like wheat. In fact, it's impossible for an expert horticulturalist to be able to pluck them out safely. But this is what happens. The human capacity to see something grand and great is there for everybody. And the wonder of it is there to think about it. People talk about it all the time. <clears throat> I remember an illustration that was told once. I think this was a true story. But anyway, if it's not, I apologize, but it was a good story. But apparently, up at Niagara Falls, there was some great uh, tightrope walker who wanted to demonstrate his skills of tightrope walking. So he had a a rope strung across, and then he walked across the falls. And his demonstration was so successful that, that there was a crowd there watching, and they were all in amazement, and he asked the question. And he said, do you think that I can put somebody in a wheelbarrow and take him across? Now, I th I'm not sure he may have already taken an empty wheelbarrow across as part of his demonstration. Now, when he asked, do you think I can, the whole crowd said, they surged with emotional confidence, yes, you can. But his next question was, 
evidence that nobody believed he could. Because then he said, well, who will volunteer to get in the wheelbarrow? Let me take him across. No one, <laughs> no one believed enough to trust their life to his lot. And you need to understand, that's the lot of these tares. They get all excited and they sing hallelujah. They see the smoke rise off the mountain. Oh man, isn't that terrific? But observing an outstanding sign from God does not mean that you have been moved to faith. And so these guys, they're really impressed with that huge banquet Jesus spread. And they declare an Old Testament prophecy as true. Surely this is the prophet who's come into the world. Now the Jews have been waiting for this prophet for years and years and they, so this is not just like joking around. They believed it like everybody believed that guy could take somebody across Niagara Falls in a wheelbarrow. They believed in the theoretical sense of the word. The actions of their belief is very interesting. And, here, and here's where the, the communion service is such an incredible memorial to us in our understanding. When we see the miraculous of Jesus and we respond to it by the flesh, we want to take that and make it a permanent fixture in our physical life. We want Jesus to be the continual source of free bread. Literally, we make it a political movement. And Jesus perceived they were about to come and make him king. An incredible picture of their ambition. They were now going to take their theological beliefs and now they were going to use their power and their strength and they were going to institute Jesus as king because they believed. Now, as we go on with the story in the next week or so, we'll see that they actually never believed, but um, they get ready to stone him by the end of the discussion. So now when evening came, his disciples, oh, excuse me, I forgot to read the most important last line, and Jesus departed again, I like the word again, Jesus departed again to the mountain by himself alone, again alone. His disciples went down to the sea, got in a boat, and went over towards Capernaum, and it was already dark, and Jesus had not come to them. So I'm going to read into this, I may be a little bit off, but the way the text is written, it sounds like that there was a little bit of impatience. They were expecting Jesus to come back and get in the boat with them. He didn't come, so they said, well, he said to go, so we go, and they just kind of go on their own, and, and Jesus missed the boat. Have you ever missed the boat? You know, that's one of the huge struggles that we have as people. We don't want to miss the boat. We, we, we just, I mean, I watch people come to church and apparently there's no boat at church to miss because they come as late as they want. But when it's time to get to the airport to catch your plane, they tell you you should be there at the very least an hour early and to be on the safe side two hours is wise. Very few people drag around and come up to the airport less than an hour before their, their flight leaves. They don't want to miss the boat. They don't want to miss the plane. Now, I want to press that point a little bit as we go farther into the discussion of the text. But um, I heard a story about jo uh, George Mueller in his 90s, he began a worldwide tour preaching in America and other places. And he had preached a fairly long tour in America, and he's getting ready to go back to England. And back in those days, which we're coming to, by the way, in America now again, back in those days, um, if you wanted to sit down on the ship, you had to bring your own seat if you hadn't paid for the upper class kind of accommodations. So the cheap fare was you just got on and you got to hang around. So you had to bring your own seat, your own chair. Well now, everybody was accustomed to it and the boat was getting to the place where it was soon to depart. One of the fine Christian American brethren recognized that, oh, I forgot to tell part of the story. So. George Mueller had a very fine chair that he used on the boat. 
and he had given instruction to somebody to bring that with all the luggage, etc., to the ship. And he was waiting patiently and kindly for that. Now, if you're 90 years old and you depend on a really nice chair to ride across the ocean, it's a matter of some significance. So this Christian American got frantic. And there was a place that you could go right there at the, at the dock, and you could go buy a, a, a chair to ride the boat with if you didn't have one. So this Christian brother said, please, please, let me buy you another chair. You're going to be stuck without a chair. And, and George Mueller's answer just so stunned me. It's really sank deep into my heart who that, what that kind of faith is. This is what he said. He said, no, I communed with my father this morning, and he assured me that he'll bring it. All is well. Don't panic. And this Christian brother, he was a, pre he was a preacher. He just was so beside himself. He kept pressing, and sure enough, just a very short time before the boat was to leave, here comes this stagecoach pulling in, and on top of all the luggage was this was George Mueller's chair coming just in the nick of time. And so what's important for us is to realize, <laughs> oh, may God help us realize this. We have situational circumstances every day in our life, and the purpose of those situational circumstances is to teach us, don't ever enter into that circumstance without first giving thanks recognizing what is, recognizing what is it, and leaving that tension back in the hands of the Lord. That's the cross. That's how you die daily. I leave it to God. And I trust him. And I'm certain that whatever the actual outcome is, I'm confident God is going to create an outcome that gives him glory, meets my need in the most appropriate way to God's purposes and glory. And so, Jesus missed the boat. And now the disciples are four miles across the lake. And I, I'm sure somebody's done this, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know it. I wonder how long it is across the lake from Tiberias to Capernaum. I wonder how long it is. Anyway, they were four miles across the lake, and it's a huge storm. And the disciples are, like, totally terrified of the storm. And then they see this ghost walking on the water. And this account doesn't mention at all Peter getting out and running a few paces before he sinks. <clears throat> Just is the illustration of everybody is afraid. Something drawing near the boat. Now I want us to understand something. Jesus went to the mountain to pray. <laughs> he was the one giving God thanks at the feeding of the 5,000, he went away to avoid the false popularity of human faith. And he got quiet with his Lord, and then he came out, the boat was gone, and he knew what he was going to do, and he walked on the water four miles out to the lake, in the middle of the lake, to where the disciples were, and he scared them to death, because, and I just want us to see something. Can you get this picture? This is an incredible picture. What scares the human heart to death? It's a ghost! What stirs the Christian to faith? Where we say, oh, it's the Lord. It's the Lord. And if you can learn to take every desperate situation that you're in and remember, oh, that's right, the Lord, you're the Lord. The Lord knew this was coming. This is the Lord. This is the Lord's caravan. If you can just rest in that, that's, that's what it means to live the life of the cross. And when we share the communion cup, we're saying, I join you, Lord. I set aside my natural expectations for a happy, perfect, pain-free life, and I want to join and be a part. And every single situation that you have is an opportunity to give God thanks, to give him glory, and to enjoy the ride. What is God going to do in this situation? Now, somehow the boat was immediately on the other side. And I should do the, the mileage later to figure it out. But anyway, the following day the people come. And they had been standing on the other side of the sea. And they saw there was no boat there. 
except at the one that the disciples had entered, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples. So they've been watching every little thing, what's going on there, all this and that and the other. And the disciples had gone away. Now they realized the other boats had come and gone, so they were like, where's Jesus? So finally they, I, I like what it says in King James, they took shipping. <laughs> They got into a boat themselves and came across to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Now I just want you to get that praise. Is it good to seek Jesus? Well, you and I would readily say, well, yeah, it's good to seek Jesus, but not in the way they sought him. And so when they found him on the other side, they said to him, Rabbi, how'd you get here? When'd you come? And like they've been trying to piece it all together and what are they? They're mesmerized. They're mesmerized with the miraculous and these are Jews and so they're looking for this miraculous sign and they're wondering, how did he get across? And who knows, they might have even imagined. Did he walk on the water? And of course he did walk on the water. That's how he got across. But Jesus answered them and listen very carefully because how many times do you pray and you say the Lord didn't answer your prayer? And I want you to understand one of the reasons for unanswered prayer is right here. Jesus said, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate and your loaves were filled. What does that mean? Well, if I'm seeking Jesus because of the signs, I'm seeking him because he's the son of God the creator of the universe, he's Lord of all, he's sovereign, and he's the one I'm gonna put my trust. And no matter how difficult a circumstance, I'm gonna to appeal to him because he's God and there's none like him. That's what signs are supposed to do, they bring us to faith in Christ. But they said, because you ate the bread and were filled. And this is what's gone on in the years of my Christianity, since 1972, I have seen and heard so many charlatans on the radio talking about signs and wonders and they have boiled it down to this erroneous view that you can get your belly filled if you have faith. And that's just a typical humanistic response to the power of God. We wanna take the power of God and we wanna be obsessed with that power and use it in our temporal circumstances and leave it there. Now, I want you to understand something, okay? I cannot say to you in a particular situation, well, you're asking God for the wrong reasons. James warns us in his little epistle, you have not because you ask not, and you ask and you receive not because you ask for the wrong motives that you might consume it upon your lust. Well, that's what this is here, filled with, your belly was filled. That you might consume it on your lust, that you might be satisfied in the temporal realm, in the moment, in the hour we're in. And what James went on to say is, that's adultery. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that f friendship with the world is enmity with God? So. Just because you think you're seeking God doesn't mean you ever sought him. Because if all you're seeking is for your circumstances to be improved, made better, happy, resolved now, here and now, that's your lust. That's, that's having a happy life and having a happy life now. So let me try to just close that with some spiritual lessons. You have these in your journal and I'm not gonna belabor most of them very long. God sees your need. You and I have trouble when we see our need and we don't remember that God sees our need. God sees our need. Your need is the door to God's provision. Now as I said, God's provision, not the imagination of what you think the provision ought to be, but your need is a door. There's a really simple construct here. You and I as human beings are never gonna seek God unless we find ourselves in a place where we need God. 
And if God had simply allowed us to not have any needs, we, the Bible says in Romans 8, we would never seek him at all. And we'd totally miss the opportunity for heaven. So need is God's doorway to bring us to him in a continual fashion. Three, we're naturally overwhelmed by the need we see and the resources we don't see. It's a natural human affair. And if you're there, you shouldn't say, man, if I could just get enough, blah, 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 blah. stop it. You get there, you say, oh, that's right, here I am. I'm at that place to bless and give God thanks and seek his glory in my circumstance. Number four, giving thanks to God is the key to the door of his provision. That's all it is, that's all it is. When you truly give God thanks in the midst of your need, what actually happens to you, if it's truly you giving God thanks, you're relieved of the anxiousness, you're relieved of the worry. Peace comes on you, peace that passes understanding. Cast all your cares upon him, because he cares for you. And the peace of God shall guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. It's not, excuse me, it is God, not the provision that we must seek. That's huge, that is so huge. In whatever circumstance you're in, you have done this. Well, I thought I was supposed to do this. You've done this. Well, I thought I was, not only was I doing this, but I thought God blessed it. And you just keep going and going and going. Then you get to this place where it looks like you can lose it all. And you say, well, wait a minute. I thought I was going down God's path. And the, the spiritual reality is this. In order for you and I to learn to trust, we have to get to the place of despair. Paul got there. And he told us about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, when we came to Asia, we were pressed out of measure, beyond ourselves, in so much that we despaired even of our very life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves to not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Anytime you assess a situation and you go, I think we got enough to cover this. You didn't have an act of faith, you just had an act of human provision that you're glad you had it in your handle. The place where we need to be attentive to <laughs> is when we look at the need and we see a lack of provision and we recognize if God doesn't enter this picture, then I'm done. But then you go one step farther. And if God enters the picture and allows me to be done, I'm now at the place where I'm ready for resurrection. He's going to bring something out of the death of this thing far above and better and more eternal than ever would have happened if it never went to full demise. Number six, our faith determines what we look on. I mentioned this verse last Sunday, just briefly mention it again. We do not look at the things which are seen but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? Look at the earthly situation you're in and you'll be panicked and terrified. Look at the unseen God who's promised to provide all of our needs in Christ Jesus, and we're fine. We can trust, we can give thanks. Number seven. There's four reflective practices here that we went over the same briefly. The men, when they had seen the sign, said, uh, this is the prophet, and they came to make, take Jesus by force. So they had a human response to a spiritual or a divine miracle. Jesus saw their human response to the divine, and he ran for his life. Well, he didn't really run for his life, he just got away from them because he was not gonna permit such foolhardiness and he went alone. Number three, the disciples went down to the sea and got into a boat. And it was already dark. And Jesus hadn't come to them. Now, I, I like the picture of the disciples is because what happens when you're Jesus' disciple and you leave without Jesus? Well, if you're going to depart from the shore without Jesus, you're going to have trouble when the storm hits because he's not going to be there. You get the point? I mean, it's, a, it's an actual factual story, but there's a spiritual application. Don't leave without Jesus in any circumstance. 
And the people, when they were near the place where they ate bread after the Lord gave them thanks, saw that Jesus was not there, they went and came seeking Jesus. You know, the worst part about a, a spiritual miracle is the human desire to have it happen again. Uh, once upon a time I thought children got bored till I started playing with my really, really young, nearly infant children. And I'd do something silly and tiresome to me for fun, and they would giggle and laugh, and then they would say this horrible word, again. I would do it again until I, they would wear me out. I could never satisfy their desire for again, as long as I was doing my magic silliness. And I want us to understand the human spirit is that way. The human heart doesn't, doesn't pick up the fragments of the precious of what God has already done and save them for memorial in the future. Did you know that there was manna from the 40 years wandering in the wilderness? Did you know there was manna in the tabernacle that was preserved until, well, I don't know how long. It doesn't say when it was preserved, but the tabernacle is missing, so we don't know. Maybe it's still there today. Who knows? That's an incredible thing. Why was, the, why was it preserved? Memorial. And when you disregard the scraps of God's blessing, you lose your memorial. Your heart forgets way too quickly. And the next time you get in trouble, you forget all about it and you just start worrying and saying you we're gonna die. <clears throat> Don't seek Jesus just because you had your belly filled. Applications, seven quick applications. <clears throat> Your need is a mercy to point you to God. Can you today say to Jesus, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this need I have. Thank you for this trouble I'm in. I see that this is a doorway for me to come to you. Beware, of the, beware as a Christian worker, do not look to your own resources. Uh, human compassion and empathy is great, but our, our ministry as a Christian workers is not out of our human capacity. And so, don't look at your resources. What I would probably like to say instead is, look to see what resources you don't have so you can get excited about what God's gonna have to do in this situation. Number three, don't allow God's unexpected provisions to change your expectations to a life with no need. Just because you ate of the bread, tasted the miracle, went through the Red Sea, just because you got to experience part of the blessing doesn't make you holy. It makes you responsible. Responsible to believe and not to become, what, it, what is it called? Entitled. Or you just, well, I'm entitled to this. This is my, my right. Four, avoid worldly popularity at all cost. Now, I really would like to share that with you young people, as young as you can understand it. Separate, separate yourself from the crowd and get quiet before God. You will be ruined by popularity. No two ways about it. You seek popularity, you waste your course. You gain popularity, you ruin your life. Number five, never seek Jesus for the relief of your need, but for the transforming power of the cross. You know, can you say, I love that phrase, and if I die, I die. If I die, I die. Can you just cherish the cross to that place where you're, you're happy to die if, that, if it's your time? Paul said he'd rather die. Number six, be on the lookout for fresh difficulties after great victories. God wants you to keep trusting him in greater and greater ways. You'll never arrive here. The greatest victory of God's provision is only going to be one little portal through one doorway. And as soon as you get through the Red Sea, there's going to be another trial to try your faith. So look for it. Look for the difficulties that you can give God thanks, give God glory, and found, ground your life on it. Number seven, don't be surprised when Jesus doesn't answer prayers for you to live a life of ease. It's not gonna happen. Let's pray. <clears throat> so Father, this is not an easy message to understand. 
because so much of life is experiencing the victory, victory over adversaries, the victory over sickness, the victory over difficulties, and we get focused on the we overcame part instead of recognizing that the process was not overcoming, the process was trusting you and giving you thanks in that moment so that you could get glory for your name. And so Lord, we just pause here this morning and Lord, I don't know the needs of each person's heart, but I just ask in your kindness that you would just bring it up to the top of their heart where they understand what their most recent, most current fear is, where they're holding out for a desperate attempt to fix it themselves, or frustration because it hasn't been fixed like they think it ought to be. But that Lord, that bless us right now to just take our need and we give it to you. We say, Lord, here's that need. And we thank you for it. Thank you that we have a lack. Thank you that we have sorrow and want. Thank you for the disappointment. Thank you for the mistreatment that we have received even this week. And we just thank you, Lord, and we give you glory. And we say, Lord, do with that in our lives. Let us, let us receive that cross, die to our expectations, and receive that transformation of life that comes when we give it all to you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and close with hymn number 427.